Amen. Joshua chapter 8. So here we are. We're in AI again. So, um, of course, um, Joshua chapter 7, um, we had the problem where um, someone um, did not follow God's commands and did not do things the way God wanted them to be done when they um, sacked Jericho and uh, they kept, you know, some of the things that they weren't supposed to keep. They stole some of the things that they were supposed to give to the Lord. And uh, they now in Joshua chapter 7, they went to Ai under those conditions and they lost the first battle um, with Ai. And everyone was, you know, worried. God told them what the problem was. They found out um, who had done it. Um, they took care of that issue. And now, of course, we see the battle where they go back again, this time the Lord on their side um, against Ai. So I want to just go through quickly. Um, the chapter, and then I want to kind of go back and show you um, some interesting things um, about Joshua chapter 8. It's kind of an interesting tie between the New Testament and the Old Testament here. Um, I, I thought it was interesting anyway. Hopefully you do too. Um, but see what we can learn from it. So let's go ahead, and um, it's important that we understand what's happening in the battle here um, to understand um, where we're going to go with this um, towards the end. So let's just step through the chapter um, real quickly. In the verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not neither be now thou dismayed. So he's kind of like building him up now. He's like, don't worry, you know, don't worry. You know, I'm with you this time. You know, you've gotten things um, taken care of, so we're going to go ahead and try this again. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise and go up to Ai, and see I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city in this land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst to Jericho and her king, only, so there's a difference here. Um, God, you know, gives different um, you know, characteristics here of things that they can and can't do. Um, so, you know, you should pay attention to what the Lord is saying because it's not just the same command for every city. So they're able to keep the spoil um, in this city. God allows them to keep the cattle and the spoil. In verse number two, he says, the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. So that's different than it was in Jericho. Um, they weren't to keep anything in Jericho, and the gold and the silver they were supposed to put into the treasury of the Lord. So they were to keep nothing for themselves out of Jericho. Here they're allowed to keep um, the spoil. So that's different. So Joshua rose, and all the people of war to go up against Ai. Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty, mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, uh, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city and behind the city, and go not very far from the city, but um, anyway, go back, um, go back to um, verse number, well, we'll just continue, and then I'll go back to that later. But he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city, go not very far from the city, but ye shall be, ye all be ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass, when they come out against us as at the first, that we will flee before them. For they will come out after us, till we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they flee before us, as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Then ye shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it shall be when ye have taken the city that ye shall set the city on fire, according to the commandment of the Lord ye shall do. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in ambush, and abode between Bethel and Ai on the west side. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. So Joshua didn't go to the people on the west side. So these people on the west side, they went um, to lie in wait and to form an ambush, to hide. And Joshua and all the people and the people of war that were with him went up and drew nigh and came before the city. That means in front of the city and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. So here's the situation. There's Ai, there's this west side of Ai, which we don't really know what the terrain is, but I would guess that it's kind of a wooded covered area over on the west side, which is why they chose that area. But on the north side is a valley. So what's in the valley? It's just big open area. So Joshua goes and he camps out in the valley in front of Ai. I mean, he's basically, he's announcing his presence to Ai. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side. So that's on the side. When they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north of the city, and their liars in wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. So in the dark or in the, you know, the failing light or whatever, Joshua goes in the middle of the valley. And it came to pass, he goes out there, and what happens? 
the king of Ai saw it. So he goes out to basically make himself seen to the king of Ai in the valley. And of course, they hasted up and rose up early. The men of the city went out against Israel to battle. And it's interesting that it's, at, you know, it's, it's either completely dark or it's not light out. And it's, but he's in the valley. He's seen. He's able to be seen. He's got his whole army out there. But he's got his real people in ambush on the west that are not seen. Okay? So, I mean, they couldn't see because it was, it was dark, it wasn't light, and they were in this valley. Okay? So Joshua, verse 15, and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people of Ai were called together to pursue after them, and they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel. So these folks went for, they went for it. Okay? So basically, they had retreated before because they had been beaten in Joshua chapter 7. They had been beaten when they lost the battle the first battle that they went up against Ai. So here, they see this big army out there, and they start running right away, and this king, you can about imagine, he's like, let's just finish this thing off right now. And he sends everything that he has after these people. There's many stories about this same type of mistake, by the way, in uh, military history. It, you, know, if you, just, you don't have to read too many, too many battle stories to see that you know, this kind of thing has been used again and again and again. All right, verse 18. And the Lord said unto Joshua, so just keep a, a, you know, an idea here in verse 18 that the Lord is directing this battle. Okay, the Lord is directing what happens in this battle. Okay, the Lord is directing the battle. The Lord said unto Joshua. Okay, the Lord didn't fight for Joshua. The Lord said unto Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it in thy hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand. And they entered into the city and took it, and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven. And they had no power to flee this way or that way. So now they're stuck. They're outside the gates. And the ambush has snuck around inside the city, and they start the city on fire to signal to the other army, we're in, we're inside, you know, the, the, it, you don't have to act anymore. You know, it's time to fight now. So basically, the men of Ai, they have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go at this point. They're stuck outside their city. Their city's on fire with the enemy inside it already. And they have this huge army in front of them that isn't really fleeing. They, they're about to learn. Okay? And when Joshua and all the city that the, saw that the ambush had taken the city. So Joshua now, who is in the retreating army, the larger force, sees the signal that the plan is... You know, and look, they don't have cell phones, right? They don't have a radio man. This is the radio right here. So the radio was the smoke of the city. Joshua now knows what's going on. And here he turns around. They turned again. They turned around and slew the men of Ai. Verse 22. And the other issued out of the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. They smote them, so they let none of them remain or escape. So they, they wiped them completely out, this army. And the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they chased them, and all were fallen at the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. So they went into Ai and killed everyone in Ai. Okay? And so it was. All that fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, even all the men of Ai. So, I mean, it wasn't a huge city, as we would think of a, a city today, but 12,000 people were killed in this city. And that was everybody. First, uh, in Joshua chapter 26, Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the cattle and spoil the city he took for prey unto themselves. So they did take the cattle and everything with them. And then um, he burnt the city. And then the king of Ai, verse 29, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded they take his carcass down from the tree, cast it 
at the entering in of the city and raised there on a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. So this is interesting. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Just a little uh, interesting note here. Um, we remember, of course, Achan. He took, well, what is the condition of these cities? You, know, you think this is pretty brutal. They go in there and they, they, just, they just wipe everybody out in these cities. You know, men, women, and children in these cities. You say, why? Well, look um, at what they did to the king. They hung him on a tree. Well, look what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse number 22. Deuteronomy 21 and verse number 22. The Bible says this. It says, it's talking about, it's talking about somebody who has committed a sin worthy of death. A sin worthy of capital punishment, of the death penalty. The Bible's for the death penalty, by the way. Okay? So, you know, and we're gonna, I'll talk to you a little bit about why um, this evening. Okay, why? Why is the, you know, why the death penalty? Why punishment at all? Okay, look, um, if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. It says, if Deuteronomy is giving you the law here, is if you, if you, if you execute somebody by hanging, execute somebody by hanging, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. And then in parentheses, look at this. So there is a extra, look, it's extra bad to get hung. Okay, if you're going to get executed, if someone's going to execute me, hey, shoot me. You know, firing squad, please. Or, or whatever, you know. Maybe not the electric chair. You know, that's gone bad a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, oh, we forgot to get the sponge wet or something like that, you know, ah, you know, just, anyway, not part of the sermon. Um, anyway, I mean, that, that was like some demented electrical engineer had to come up with that, right? Anyway, um, hanging is an extra, it, it's a curse to be hung, okay? So it's not only that you're being executed, but it's, it's literally a curse, the Bible says. So it says here, um, for, every, for he that is hanged is what? It says, accursed of God. Now what was the condition of the people in these cities? What was the condition of the people in these cities? What was the condition of everything, as a matter of fact, in these cities? Everything that was to be destroyed was under what condition? It was accursed of God. That's what Achan's problem was, was he took of the accursed thing. Okay, it wasn't like some special weird thing. That was, it was everything. Everything in the city, the people, the stuff, everything was accursed, the Bible says, except for the gold and silver, which he just plain stole from God. So this king was accursed. That's why he was hung. That's why Joshua hung him, because he was accursed of God, just like Achan took of something that was accursed of God. It's the condition. So you say, well, it's pretty brutal what they did to these cities. These cities were accursed of God. Every single person was accursed of God in these cities. Okay, that was the condition that they were in. Okay, now go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 just very quickly, um, and we'll see one other thing um, about this. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 13. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 13. So back, you know, just finishing off this idea of being hung or being hung on a tree. The Bible says in Galatians 3.13, are you there? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So look, before we were saved, before we were redeemed by Christ, we were, we were under a curse as well. We were under a curse. Look, everybody that is not saved is cursed right now. They are cursed by the law. Okay, they are cursed because they have broken God's law, and until they are redeemed or saved, they're still under that curse. Okay, but look what it says here. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Christ, he took the punishment for our sin, but he was literally, he was literally made that curse for us. He was that propitiation. That, that, that he became the curse, he became the cursed for us. So it was the substitute. You were cursed, instead he became cursed. And that's how you can be saved, redeemed through him. Okay, just an interesting little point there. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 8 and verse number 30. I mean, it's such a beautiful, complete picture when you think about the salvation and the, the redemption that Christ 
provided for us. I mean, it's just a complete picture of redemption. Um, it, it just it completes the, the circle of everything that the Bible talks about. Look at verse 30. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. Remember Mount Ebal um, from Deuteronomy chapter 27? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse number 10. I'll just read it for you. You don't have to turn there. You can if you'd like to. But this is where Moses prophesied this event that's about to take place. I talked about it in the sermon um, at the woman at the well. But in Deuteronomy 27, Moses said in verse 10, Thou, that, thou shalt therefore obey the, Lord, the voice of the Lord thy God, and do his commandments and his statutes which I commanded thee this day. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon the Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over the Jordan. Moses is prophesying what's going to happen in, you know, when they get over the Jordan and, and take over um, this area. You know, and he says all these tribes, and then he says, um, uh, he said, Cursed be the man, in verse 15, that maketh any graven image or molten image or abomination to the Lord, the works of the hands of the craftsmen, and put it in a secret place. Interesting. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth the light by his father and mother, and all the people should say, Amen. And that was the people that stood on Mount Ebal to curse. So Mount Gerizim got the blessings, and then six tribes stand on Mount Ebal um, to curse. Look, in, in, in this area, look, these battles are not over. There's plenty to curse still. That's, that's the point of the blessings and the curses here is that they set up these altars and you know the Levites stood in the middle and they laid out curses and they laid out blessings. There's plenty more people that are going to be cursed in the promised land. Look at Joshua chapter 8 and verse 31. Now we see in Joshua chapter 8 and verse 31, we see the, the prophecy that Moses said, we see it coming true. Joshua actually does it. And it says in verse 31, As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, over which no man hath lift up any iron. You'll see that, by the way, many places in the Bible. When they build altars and they build things to the Lord, especially altars, you're not to hew the stone or, or put a, any kind of tools to the stone. And you know what? I actually thought about this this morning um, when I was, I was waking up, and I have one of these. I don't know if you guys have these same screensavers or whatever, but I, every morning I wake up and I, I hit my mouse, and it's, it's some like beautiful landscape somewhere on earth. You know, and this morning it was some place, and then if you go up to the top right corner of your computer screen, it tells you where it's at. Because you look at it and you're like, oh man, I love to go there. And then you look at where it's at, and it's like in, you know, Zimbabwe or something. You're like, yeah, I'm not going there. You know? But anyway, um, this morning I, I did it, and it was like this big, uh, you know, no offense to people from Zimbabwe, but, you know, I don't know. I just, it just came to my mind. Anyway, uh, this morning it was some place in Utah, and it was like all these, these rocks, you know, that, that just had all these you know, these red rocks and yellow rocks with all these different patterns on them and holes through them and these big flat rocks sitting over there. I mean, you're like, this is like a different planet. You know, this is not real, you know. And, and you're looking at it, but here's the thing. Like, God did that. Amen. You know, God did that. So, I mean, I kind of look at, like, why God didn't want us hewing these rocks because it's kind of like someone taking, like, a, like a, a, a famous painting and then, like, painting over the top of it. Right? It's like, it's like if, if my wife would have had painting day with the kids and instead of using like, you know, blank white paint, you know, canvases, they would have used like, you know, million dollar paintings from some, I'm not even going to mention a painter because they're all wicked. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're all evil people. But, I mean, if we just take some, some beautiful painting from some really talented painter, and then we would just make our painting over it. We'd have our Joel Osteen drawing contest over the top of these really expensive paintings. That's like us, like, hewing rocks, right? I mean, God's already created these beautiful things. He's like, you know what? Just, uh, that's just my opinion on this. But um, just a thought that I had this morning. But anyway, so he builds these altars. After doing this in verse 30, uh, 32, and then he writes, um, he writes a copy of the law of Moses. And in verse 33, it says, And all Israel and their elders and officers and judges stood on this side of the ark and that side before the priests. And the Levites would bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger and he that was born amongst them. Half of them over on Mount Gerizim for the blessings and half of them over against Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before thee that they should bless the people of Israel. And then they're cursing, look, they're cursing 
the other people. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. And there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were con conversant among them. So, I mean, basically, I mean, that's another good just example of how, you know, there's, there's, bless there's blessings and cursings in the Bible. I mean, the problem, you know, you'll see today is people just talk about the blessings all the time. People never talk about the negative. There's a lot of cursings in the Bible. There's actually a lot of consequences and there's a lot of bad things and there's a lot of wrath in the Bible, even against saved people. Even against, you know, saved people. Like, hey, you know, I'm saved now, but look, if I do things a certain way, I could bring God's anger and his indignation against myself. So, I mean, people leave that out today. You know, and that's what you see um, in churches today, and that's why churches, you know, they, they get so many people in because it's just blessing, blessing, blessing. But what about, you know, what about Mount Ebal? You know, what about the other mountain? There's blessings and cursings, okay? So we see the strategy here, and what I really want to point out, I want to make a few observations of Joshua chapter 8, and then I want to kind of give you some thoughts on applying that to your life. But first of all, you know, we see here, God is kind of a strategist, we see in Joshua chapter 8. You know, God is a strategist. Notice here, but I mean, he's basically, he's basically the military commander of the Israelites. Right. You know, he's basically the military commander. I mean, he provides the strategy here, but it's interesting because as God provides the strategy, he expected them to take ownership of the plan. You know, God, I mean, he expected the Israelites to carry out the actions. It's, look, it's the same thing for us. I mean, think about this for a second. Why didn't God, if he was with them, if he was with them and he had, you know, the Son of God there willing to help with his sword, and why didn't he just, you know, just take care of it? Why didn't he just, I mean, turn to Genesis 19. God has done this before. God has done this. Why didn't he do it? Look at Genesis chapter 19 and look at verse number 24. Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 24. I mean, look what God did here. God just took care of this city. You know, God wanted this city gone, and he made it gone. It's that simple. Look at verse 24 of Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Look, God just rained fire from heaven and just destroyed these two cities. And he, over, and he overthrew those cities. And all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and, and that which grew upon the ground. Look, in Joshua chapter 8, God didn't do this. God did not do this. He gave the tactics. He gave Joshua the commands, the orders. He was, he was, the, he was the general, so to speak. But the people needed to carry out the plan. You see, the same applies to us in our lives. God is not going to execute battles for you. He tells you what to do, and if you do them, you will win, and if not, see chapter 7. That, that's, you know, that's, that's the, the lesson. But here's what's really interesting, okay? Here's what's really interesting. God is such a brilliant strategist. Think about this for a second. He can literally use our defeats to achieve victory. Think about what happened in Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel disobeyed God. They didn't do what he said. God was not with them. The man with the sword was not with them that time. And they lost the battle. Now, to achieve the victory in the second battle, God literally used the fact that they lost the first battle to achieve victory and draw the men out of the gates completely so they would have that complete victory. God used in his strategy to gain victory. Look, but it was, it was this. Go back to verse 14 of Joshua 8. It was that defeat because of Achan's sin that God used to give them victory. But something happened first. Go to Joshua chapter 8 and verse 14. Look, let's look, at the, let's look at the victory for a minute first. Joshua chapter 8 and verse 14. And it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, that they hasted and rose up early, and the men of the city went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, at a time appointed before the plain, but he wist not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. It wasn't like that last time. I just went out and beat him last time. 
There was no ambush last time. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them. This king was like, we've done this before. We got him again. Let's go, everybody. And all the people that were in Ai gathered, were called together to pursue after them. And they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. God used the fact that they ran once before to lure in the enemy. God used the defeat to strategize in victory is what he did. Now, here's the application for us. How to turn defeat into victory like Joshua did. Like God did for Joshua. How can we turn victory or defeat in our lives into victory? Turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to wait for you all to get there because I want you to see this. Turn to Romans chapter 8. This is super interesting because this is a super common verse in the Bible. You see it pasted on refrigerators. Nobody really understands it, though. Especially people from, you know, you know the blessings-only churches. They don't understand it. They're just like, you know, everything good is always going to happen to me always because I'm me. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. We know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This verse is Joshua chapter 8 right here. Joshua chapter 8 is Romans 8, 28 played out in a practical situation. You say, I don't understand. I'm going to explain it to you. The mistake that they made was used for the good. Was used for the good to give them victory. Notice, notice, but look, notice, it was only used once they got right. It was only for the good once they got right. Look, it says, it says, we know that all things work together for the good. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say there will be some things in your life that I will make to turn out good. It says all things work together for the good. But the verse doesn't stop there. See, everybody thinks the verse stops there, and that's where they all go wrong. That's where it makes the refrigerator magnet, right? All things work out to good. Well, that's just not going to happen. It's all things. Look, all things do work out. Not just some things, but there's more. It says, it doesn't say everything works out together for good for everybody all the time. That's not what it says. No matter what. Nope, that's not what it says. Look, there are conditions to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. The step one, step one condition on turning defeat into victory is this. It's getting right. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. You want to turn defeat into victory in your life. You say, think back in your life. You had any defeats in your life? Think back in your life. You ever had something that didn't go well? How about before you were saved? Have any defeats before you were saved in your life? Want to turn those into victory? That can happen. But first things first. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. The Bible says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Catholics and Lutherans and other people that don't understand the Bible say that this is how you get saved. This is why people think you have to confess your sins to get saved. But that's not what it says. It says if you confess your sins, God will forgive your sins. That's what it says. It's talking about getting right with God by confessing your sins. Find your faults and own them is what the Bible is saying here. Some people, look, some people really stumble here. But look, it's super important. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. This is super important in mending any relationship that you want to be whole. Okay? If you want a relationship in your life to be whole, yes, it's true that we're supposed to forgive one way. We are supposed to forgive one way. Are you in Matthew chapter 6? Look at verse number... Matthew chapter 6, look at verse number thir uh, 14. The Bible says this. It's very simple. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Not talking about salvation. Talking about being right with God. You want to be right with God? You want to have God forgive you and not chastise you for the sins in your life? Be forgiving to other people. Is what the Bible is saying. If you just withhold forgiveness from the people and the brothers and sisters in your life, God's going to just chastise you harder. That's what the Bible is saying here. Right. He's not going to be lenient with you. If you're hard on other people, God's going to be harder on you. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Right. 
That's what the Bible is saying here. So look, forgiveness is to be one way. If one of the brothers in this church, you know, just constantly just offends me, I'm supposed to just forgive him. Just forgive him. It doesn't mean that, like, if brother so-and-so, you know, I keep borrowing him $20 and he never pays me back, you know, it doesn't mean I have to keep borrowing him $20. It doesn't mean I have to learn, you know, I can't learn from that. It just says I'm not to, I'm not to just, you know, hate him for that. I'm supposed to just let it go, forgive him for that. Okay, but look, that doesn't mean that our relationship is whole. That doesn't mean that our relationship is whole. Turn to Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 21. I'll give you another verse on this. So forgiveness is to be one way. It is to be one way. But if you have one way forgiveness, it doesn't mean the relationship is whole. Look at Matthew chapter 18 and look at verse number 21. We're talking about getting right as Israel got right. We're talking about how do we get right. I want Romans 8.28 to come true in my life. Don't you? So the first thing we have to do, Romans 8.28 is Joshua chapter 8. The first thing we have to do is get right. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 21. The Bible says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I brought my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Like seven times? It's like, how many times should I forgive somebody that keeps doing the same thing to me? And Jesus says, I say not unto you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. He's like, basically, what he means is just, just keep forgiving him. That's what Jesus means. But that's really just instructions for us to be right. Does that make sense? Yep. If I want to be right between, you know, if I want to be right with God, I need to forgive brother so-and-so, just keep forgiving. And just keep forgiving. I don't have to be stupid and allow him to borrow my car when he wrecked the last five cars. But I have to just let it go and just forgive him. Then I'm right with God. That doesn't make my relationship with him whole. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. If you want the entire relationship between brother so-and-so and myself to be whole, then confession needs to happen on both sides. Or on the sides where it's needed, anyway. Turn to James chapter 5. So, brother so-and-so, I gave him, you know, my car, and he just drove it off a cliff and started it on fire. And he just burned up my car. And I'm just like, you know what, brother, I, I just, I forgive you. But he's just like, should have done the brakes better. You know? It was a piece of garbage car anyway. You know, I'm just like, I just forgive him. I just forgive him. That's my job. But that's not a whole relationship there. If we want our relationships to be whole amongst two people both ways, here's what needs to happen. The Bible says in James 5.16, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. See that? You see that? Confess your faults to one another. This doesn't mean you come up to me and tell me every, you know, you go up to Brother Matt and tell him every sin you've committed in your life. That's not what this means. Okay? Brother Matt is like, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's not what this means. It's not I mean we don't come to church and just be like, all right, Brother Ryan, it's your turn. Get up here, buddy. Tell us everything you've ever done, you know? And, you know, it's saying confess your faults one to another. If you have faults between each other, get that stuff out there and confess them to each other. Amen. Apologize to me for driving my car off the cliff and starting it on fire. Amen. And don't blame it on me that the brakes were bad, okay? It's saying, and it says that ye. You know what ye means? Here's, here's one of those words again that no one thinks are important. Ye is plural. Amen. It says that ye may be healed. That ye, meaning, meaning brother Trevor and brother Johannes, that ye may be healed, that that relationship between those two will be brought whole again. Okay? Confess your faults to one another. Okay? You've got you to own it. You, you've wronged your brother. You've got to own it. Okay? So if two people have trouble in a relationship, they must, and, may, and many times they may both have faults to confess. Maybe Brother Johannes got mad at Brother Trevor for driving his car off the cliff, and Brother Johannes, you know, went and smashed Brother Trevor's car with a baseball bat. Now they both have faults. So they both need to come together and confess those faults. Okay? Now, go back to Joshua chapter 7. What did Joshua say to Achan? Who did Achan sin against? Look at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 19. The Bible says this, 
in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 19. So we must get right. If we want Romans 8.28 to work, if we want the machine of Romans 8.28 to work and have these things work out for us, the Bible says that we must get right. Look at Joshua 7.19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. That's interesting right there because he tells them to confess straight to God. Not to a priest. Amen. Not to any man. Right. He says, confess to him. This is before Christ. Okay? And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And he confesses the whole thing. He confesses to Joshua, and more importantly, he confesses to the Lord. Amen. Okay? He gets right. He gets right. So, look, he, he, he did 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. He confessed his sins unto the Lord. Okay? So, but think about this. They executed the guy <laughs> right after he did this. So you're like, uh, what in the world? I mean, they knew he did it, right? So, I mean, why, you know, you think about it this way. This wasn't a thing about, you know, the law. This wasn't a thing about, you know, um, it was about getting right. The confession was about getting right with God. But the execution still took place, folks. You know, so the confession to God was necessary to fix the relationship with God. That fixed the relationship with God. But, I mean, as confession we saw has a, has a huge part of mending relationships. People could say he confessed, so why punish him? Why punish him? Why is there punishment for sin instead of just confession? I mean, did this guy really need to die? I mean, think about it. Look, here's the answer. Here's the answer. I'll answer it for you. It wasn't just about this guy. Punishment is not about that guy. It never was. It was about the nation. The punishment of Achan was about the nation of Israel. The punishment was to deter others from the same sin. I mean, they named the valley, the Valley of Achor. I mean, they wanted people to remember this event where this family was stoned and burned. They made a marker of it. Look, that is the, that is the purpose of punishment. Look, if you execute murderers, you will have a lot less murder. And, and you wonder why, I mean, look, I'm at Leslie's pool supply the other day. You, you, wanna, see, you wanna see this all, you wanna see the opposite of this? California has a law where basically you can steal anything under $950 and it's just a, a misdemeanor. You can't even get in trouble for it. And so, like, theft, it, talk to any person that works at any retail store. They have actually shut down some retail stores now because they're just getting robbed like crazy. I'm at Leslie's Pool Supply the other day and I'm standing in a line and there's two young uh, gentlemen in their 20s working the counter and this guy, this guy walks in and you know, he's a guy that looks like he's going to steal something. All right? He walks in and of course, what's he got on his face? He doesn't want to catch coronavirus. So he's got a big mask on his face. All you can see are just little, little, little beady eyes. And he walks straight in the store and his pants are around his knees and he, and he walks up to the the shelf, and he, I don't even know how he could walk like that. And he grabs like the first thing he can find, and he just gets up and he just walks right out the door. And the guy, the guy behind the counter is like, and I'm just like, you want me to go get him? Because I'll go get him. And he's like, no, just forget it. He's like, who cares? I mean, it was like 50 bucks. I went and checked it before I left. It was like 50 bucks. I'd be, I'd be executed if I did something like that. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, the point is, the point is, when you have no punishment for crime, it's just completely out of control. That's why they executed Aiken. It wasn't for Aiken, it was for the rest of the nation. And look, that's where we're headed today. Just complete lawlessness is where we're headed today. I, I, don't, know what, I don't know what people are thinking. You know, they're not, they, it just shows you they know nothing of even the concepts of the Bible. It's not that they don't know the Bible. They don't even know the concepts of the Bible anymore. So, back to our point. We want Romans 8.28 to work in our lives. We first need to get right. We need to mend that relationship with God. But look, the, it actually says in Romans 8.28, to them that love God. Turn to John 14. John 14. A lot of people, I'm sure, would say, I love God. I love God. 
The difference, but here's the thing, the difference between your definition or man's definition of love and God's definition of love is that love is action to God and it is a feeling to man. That's the difference. Tell, you, tell your wife that you love her. Tell your wife that you love her, but then live your life only thinking of yourself. Live your life, tell, just tell her, tell her that every day though. Love you, honey. Love you. I love you so much. And then just do nothing for her. Just live your life in the most selfish possible way that you can. And I guarantee you, she will not think that you love her. Why? You tell her every day. It's because your actions show otherwise. So if, you, if love is just a feeling to you, the only person that will think or feel that love is you. Nobody else will feel or will, will benefit or will actually get that love because that, that's not what love is. Does that make sense? Look at John chapter 14 and verse 15. God actually desi- de- defines this for us in like eight words or seven words or whatever that is. The Bible says this. It says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Turn to James chapter 1. Look, the Bible says, if you love me, Listen to what I say, God says. And it's more than that. Look at James chapter 1 and verse number 22. James chapter 1 and verse number 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So God says if you love me, you know, look, nothing is more maddening. Nothing is more maddening than someone who listens or seems to to listen to your direction I mean, I've said this to my kids many times. My kids have heard this maybe a million times. If if you want to anger me, make me repeat myself again and again. Because nothing angers me more than that. Than than just having to having to just repeat yourself again and again and again. And God says the same thing. He says, He says, Don't just don't just hear what I say, don't just listen to what I say. You have to do it. You have to do it. You must listen, hear, and do, the Bible says. And then, and then you love God, and then I will turn your defeats into victories. Amen. Joshua chapter 8 and Romans chapter 8. And then God can use past defeats, past weaknesses as means of victory in your life. I mean, look, once they got right, once they confessed, once their actions were corrected, Look, he confessed. Then they, they, they followed through on everything. And God literally used their defeat to gain them victory. I mean, examples in your life could be, you know, waste, just, wait, just plain wasted time in your life. How much time have you wasted of your life? How much time? Look, that is something that God can use. That God can use. I'm just going to throw out a couple ideas that I'm not the general, okay? You understand? I'm not the general. I'll just throw out a couple ideas that I can think of, just a man. Okay? I'm not the strategist that's going to do this, though. Wasted time. God can use wasted time to spur you, to motivate you. You could waste half your life, and God could use that to motivate you and drive you forward through the rest of your life. Amen. Mistakes made. Maybe you made huge mistakes in your life. Maybe you faced dangers. I mean, look, maybe, maybe you know, Maybe you didn't have good parents. Maybe your parents didn't do anything right. Maybe your parents were wicked. Maybe your parents were were bad people. You know what? You can use that. God can use that to drive you to be the best parent, according to what the Bible says. You can use that. Look, maybe, maybe there was alcohol problems or drug problems in your life. You can use that to, you know, just emphasize that danger to other people your family, yourselves, everybody. You can have that influence over people because of those, those defeats that you've had in the past. Does that make sense? Look, this is how there's a plan B for your life, no matter where you're at in your life. This is how there's a plan B. But you need, like, it's, it's super important to understand that you need to follow the right path to achieve it. And then, you know, you can have, I mean, you can have Romans 8, 28 realized but you say you know you say I mean a lot of people get just just bogged down in their past defeats 
I mean, too many people. I mean, we're raising, we're raising entire generations, entire cultures of people that we're just, we're just convincing them to just do nothing but just be bogged down in past defeats. Do nothing but focus on your past and the things that have gone wrong in your life and, you know, do nothing about that. But look, all you have to do is just get right, confess your sins, get right with God, love God, do what He says, and then look, here's the thing. I just gave you some silly little examples. But here's, here's how God can turn anything, here's how God can turn any messed up situation. Think of the most messed up situation you can think of in somebody's life. The reason that God can turn those things into those defeats into victories is because he intervenes. You see? God's not just, you know, magic invisible man. God is telling us in Romans 8.28 that if you do these things, he's like all things. He says all things. I don't care how big of a mess it is. I don't care how big of a mess it is. I don't care what you've done. He's like, you get right and you love me He's like, I will intervene. Amen. That's what the Bible's saying. And that's exactly what happened in Joshua chapter 8. That's right. God intervened. And he took that defeat and made it a victory. He can put strategies together that we, you know, we can't even think of. Right? I mean, his ways are way higher than our ways. He can take anything that you've done, anything that you've been defeated with, you get right, you confess everything, you get right with God, you start doing the right things, and God will step in. I mean, God will step in. I think people, I used to kind of think this way, actually. You know, before I was saved, and maybe even a little bit after I was saved, I actually used to kind of think this way. That, you know, God doesn't really, it's kind of up to us to drive this bus of our life. You know, I, I remember I always had this friend growing up. I grew up with this friend in Sunday school from like second grade. And, you know, even when we were in our 20s, he was always talking about, well, the Lord wants me to do this and the Lord wants me to do this. I'm just like, God talked to you? Is God talking to you? You know, the Lord did this. How do you know God did that? You know, I was kind of a skeptic. But look, if you're saved and you are right with God, and you, I mean, you've gotten right and you are loving God with your life, God will move stuff around for you and you'll see it happening. You will see it work. I, I promise you. I promise you. I don't care how messed up it is. And, and look, look, here's another thing. The more messed up it is, the more you'll see it moving. Joshua chapter 8, Romans 8, 28. Let's bow our heads and have a word.